Hello, 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 and welcome to another edition of our Beatles program, which is called Things We Said Today. I'm Ken Michaels, and this is the show that centers mainly on what's going on in the world of the Beatles, news-wise. And most folks know me from my Beatles syndicated radio show called Every Little Thing, and I'm being joined by my co-host, Mr. Beatles Examiner himself, and uh, the writer for many Examiner columns, Steve Marinucci. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ken. Hi, everybody. Before we start with our program, I'm sure a lot of people who have been listening to things we said today are a bit surprised with the way that the show started out. That's true. <laughs> we have a new theme, and uh, actually one of our listeners, Michael Lynch from Long Island, submitted that to us, and we thought that uh, it was appropriate to play. He's got a real... Uh, 1963 Beatles from me to you sound to it. That's how mm -hmm. I would uh, define it. So we're going to be using that now at the start and the end of every show. It's actually called, believe it or not, the theme for Ken and Steve, which is a surefire way of, of, uh, of making sure that no one will want to buy it. Right. That's, <laughs> that's true. Thank you, Michael. I want to thank you for that. It's a, it's a, it's a really nice theme. Yeah, it really fits. It it does, and it actually kind of leads into what we're talking about today. Yeah, actually, um, as we're doing this show, we're recording this on March the 20th, and in two days from now, it will be the 50th anniversary of the Beatles' first album released in the UK called Please Please Me. Hard to believe that it's 50 years ago, but it is. And so we're going to be saluting that album here on the show and uh, paying tribute to it. As we should, because, hey, anytime it's a first for anything, and we're going to be approaching so many 50th anniversaries coming up, because it is that time, we should take note of many of them. And this being the Beatles' first album, we thought we'd talk about it. So, Steve, what are your thoughts on, on that particular album as you look back on it now, 50 years later? Well, one of the things that's really interesting, I mean, every, everybody that's listening, I'm sure, knows the story of when it was recorded, I mean, uh, how the fact it was recorded in one day. And that was, that's, of course, very, you know, very interesting. But what's really interesting, and I, I was just reading, a, going through a book, I believe it was Bill Harry's uh, Beatles Encyclopedia, and you would think that they recorded these songs in one or two takes. That is not the case. I mean, they recorded some some of these songs were recorded in, in uh hold me tight was recorded in 13 takes although the versions they used didn't get used but um well i think i think boys was done in one take boys was yeah boys was done in one take twist and shout was done in two love to see the uh the uh outtake of that or hear the outtake of that uh -huh. there's a place uh was done in nine takes uh, and many of those have been floating around I saw her standing there was in 10, Misery 11. The really amazing part of this, in that 10 hours, they really worked. They didn't just coast through and do this thing you know, really quickly. You know, they, they were working, and Bill Harry notes that they worked through their lunch. So, I mean, they, that, ten, that day, they were working from beginning to end. Of course, when John went to... Thing, um, twist and shout at the end of the day, his voice was was shot from more than just the fact that they'd been you know he'd been singing all day. I mean they'd been mm. knocking themselves pretty hard to get this thing done. They right. were determined. Well, by the way, I, one thing that I always like to point out, and this mm -hmm. is not taking away anything from the feat of recording the album in one day, but there are fourteen tracks and they recorded ten of them in one day. So we should really distinguish that, because the mm -hmm. first two singles had already been recorded and released. Right. Of Love Me Do, P.S. I Love You, Please Please Me, and Ask Me Why. The other ten songs were recorded in one day, which is something to be, that's an amazing feat to itself. Mm -hmm. So, But everybody always says they recorded the first album in one day. It's, it's, a, it's a half truth, you know, but mm -hmm. still, you know, ten songs out of the 14, that's, that's uh, you know, that was something to be really uh, proud of right there. And the fact that they were, this was not a veteran group. I mean, they were, you know, they were still, you know, pretty, they were new to the whole situation to 
uh, although this was not their first session, their, this is not their first CMI session, but, you know, they were still young, you know, and they were under George Martin's direction, right. obviously. It wasn't like later when, you know, they controlled everything, but, you know, they, I mean, it was amazing that they were able to get all this done and to to get it done, and then you have to, you know, you have to really uh, mention that and, and commend them for that. Yeah, well, you just said they they were not a veteran group, but mm-hmm. you have to realize that John and Paul and George had already worked together for, you know, four or five years, not in the studio, but they certainly right. rehearsed a lot and performed a lot. And one of the things that I always like to point out is that if you compare the Please Please Me album to the Deck Audition recordings, which were 13 months earlier, it's like night and day. Mm-hmm. I mean, they really improved in, in that time. And uh, maybe I'm being a bit unfair because the deck audition recordings were done on New Year's Day. It was a cold day. It was early in the morning. They were rushed. Mm-hmm. So, but by the time they had gotten to Please Please Me, so many of those songs they knew so well. And, and that, despite the fact that some of them were, were new compositions at the time. But what is remarkable to me is just how much Ringo fit in as a drummer so quickly, even though uh, the problem that they had with Love Me Do and getting a session player with Andy White there for what became the version that was on the album. But, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, with the exception of Love Me Do and and P.S. I Love You, Ringo was the drummer on all the other songs, but he just fit right in, you know, and very quickly because he joined the group in the middle of August, so we only had about six months there. So, you know, for all that's said about him being the final piece of the puzzle, I think when you listen to an album, and this is the earliest example of an album from the Beatles, you know, what a great job he did on those songs. Right. So much and energy you, on those. And you, and you mentioned the Deca, the Deca tapes, and the sound, uh, not only did the, the group sound more developed now, than they did on the Decca tapes. The sound of the group itself, because they were we were talking two different producers, had uh, George Martin really added a lot to that sound compared to the real. I mean, they were they were you could hear they were nervous on the Decca tapes. I mean, there was no question there, um, and they were a lot more. I don't know how to say calmer, stable. I guess uh-huh. maybe would be, would be a, a good way to to put it. They were they were a lot more prepared for please please me than they were for the decade tapes. No yeah, they, they were as I like to put it, they were ready mm-hmm. at this point. Mm-hmm. I think they were very comfortable at that point, being the Fab Four, being the foursome. And uh, you know, it's it's a fascinating thing to see how the Beatles evolved through the years, and certainly how much better they became a, a performing band especially in 1963, which was the most active year for them in terms of the BBC recordings that they had to do and Mm -hmm. the concerts that they did. You know, they barely had time to breathe. So you can tell how they were improving as musicians. And here it is, is February 11th of 63, when they recorded 10 of those 14 songs. And they're, you know, at the same time as being raw, they're all so polished, <laughs> if that makes any sense. Right. David uh, Rowley, in um, the book All Together Now, which just came out in the U.K., says uh, has something interesting that I'm not sure that I've, I've heard before. I know that George Martin had wanted to record a live album at the, uh, uh, the you Cavern. Know, record them live at the Cavern. Right. Well, he says, please, please me. They, they had considered doing recording Please Please Me in front of a group of fans at Abbey Road. I mean, think about that. They decided not to do it. But, um, and because they were they were basing it on what Cliff Richard had done with uh, the Cliff album. And so uh, that's an interesting, assuming it's true. I didn't know I, that. I mean, I, I knew, I, I've heard about them wanting to record at the Cavern. And so what they tried to do was have a live atmosphere for a studio recording, which I think they really captured very well. Right, but Rowley says, and and I'm going to read directly from the book here, it says, knowing of the group's popularity at the Cavern, he suggested it might be made there or as a show in front of a small group of fans at Abbey Road. And then, of course, they turned the idea down. 
I, I, can you imagine if they had done that? That would have been <laughs> that's that shocking. Been really, yeah, that would have been that would have been really really interesting if they had to done start that. to start your career that way. Mm hmm. And huh. they didn't. And, you know, obviously, they didn't. Another thing was, I think it was Bill Harry mentioned how much the session cost. Session cost four hundred pounds, which at today's rate is about six hundred dollars. Can you imagine what a ten-hour session today would cost? A lot more. <laughs> a lot. Uh, more. I think I think the session for Please Please Me paid off. Yeah, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think so. I think so. I also but, think it's kind of interesting when you take a look at. Um, the Beatles' first four albums, and obviously A Hard Day's Night really sticks out because it's all original songs, but the remaining three, they seem to have, and they must have been conscious of this, they had the same formula of eight original songs, six covers. Mm -hmm. And that's how it was with, with The Beatles and Beatles for Sale. So I really like the selection and also witnessing how they progressed as songwriters but you know even these early examples of their songwriting is is very impressive mm -hmm. you know i really do think that ask me why is a song that was very different for its time it's not structured like a lot of songs of that time and they even have different chords they're minor or minor sevens at the very beginning not that the beatles invented them but to have them on a pop record you know and to think that they wrote that song so young it's, it's something that um, you know. I'm just very impressed with. They were taking chances early on. It's it's really amazing. And even if you study music, a song like "Do You Want to Know a Secret," the bass line in there is different from what most pop bands would have done at the time. A lot mm -hmm. of bands would just use the root of the chord and do something very simple. But it actually had a you know a very melodic line in "Do You Want to Know a Secret." Right. I still uh, and, and not to to get off the subject too much, but that the way Paul um, played bass on Sgt. Pepper still, you know, with the um, getting better where he was sliding up and down on the on the, uh -huh. on, on, the on the bass that just blows me over every time I hear it. I just I love that. But anyway, back back to this. I mean, there's just so many things. You know, they were young. They were you know they were looking to make the big time. You know, with this album and. It was just it's just amazing that that they were able to make this work you know that uh, that it worked so well for them uh, it's just great that uh that it worked out the way it did right I also just like the fact that this is a great mix of originals and covers, and when I think of the Beatles, there's a word that always pops into my head that I probably overuse, which is eclectic and even in the early years of the Beatles, going back to their performing days in hamburg if you if you take a look at what the Beatles used to perform as part of their repertoire, it was so varied. And right. even on this first album, you've got songs that are rockers, like I Saw Her Standing There. You've got more R&B-flavored songs, like Anna. You've got something like A Taste of Honey, which was taken from you know the film of the same name, although it was influenced by a version that Lenny Welch sang. Right. You've got all these different types of songs, even at the very beginning. And... Um, you know, the fact that the Beatles really showed how much they loved girl groups early on. Because oh, yeah. two of the songs on here are Shirelle songs, mm -hmm. Boys and Baby It's You. And um, even uh, Chains was a, a girl group song by a, a group mm -hmm. called The Cookies. Right. So they liked all kinds of music, even early on. And this is just, you know, the earliest example of that. Unless you and go like, back to a lot of the stuff that they did in Hamburg and, and listen to, say, the Star Club and, mm -hmm. and and music like that. And I like the fact that if you were, you were to take a bunch of the songs that they covered, just the songs that they covered, and if you, for example, Ken, if you took, and you may have done this in the past, if you took just and played the original versions of the cover songs, I mean, that would be a show that would be a great show to listen to because the songs are just so good. Right. You know, and a lot of people have not heard, unfortunately, have not heard some of the original versions of these songs. I think a lot of people have heard Anna. But, uh, for example, uh, you know, Arthur Alexander also did Soldier of Love, which right. is an incredible song. And it's a wonderful. shot of rhythm and blues. And shot of rhythm and blues, yeah. I mean, uh, those three alone. But um, you know, some of the songs they recorded, or uh, some of the songs they covered, 
in themselves were fantastic, and you know they had incredible taste. Well, the Beatles, the Beatles were great at covering songs. And one of the things that I appreciate more and more as time goes on, and it doesn't just apply to the Beatles, but you also study the other, the British Invasion artists. When they take a, a songwriter and an artist like Arthur Alexander, who is not part of the, he, he's not one of the icons of the mm-hmm. 50s. You know, he's not the Chuck Berry, Little Richard, Elvis Presley, Buddy Holly in that group. When you take an artist like that, or Larry Williams, and you do songs from them, and you give those songs exposure, a lot of people were exposed to those songs through the Beatles first. And likewise, with Arthur Alexander, the Stones covered You Better Move On. So there are groups, the British Invasion groups, that notice these other artists. And I'm just so appreciative of the fact that they didn't just point to the most well-known 50s artists. Right. And that really, that really made an impact back in the 60s. Because, you know, a lot of people, I mean, even, even Chuck Berry, who, you know, you kind of take for granted now, if it hadn't been for, I wouldn't say it, it, it was only because of the, what the Beatles did, but the Beatles sure did a lot to put Chuck Berry, you know, in the spotlight. He would agree with that. Carl Perkins thanked them forever. Just to, to interject a, a little story, this is another piece of trivia. In Bill Harry's uh, Beatles Encyclopedia, he said McCartney wanted to record Bass on My Mucho, but they decided on A Taste of Honey instead. And I think that would have been, that would, it wouldn't have, I think that was a good decision. Yeah. I don't think their version of Bass on My Mucho was as good as what A Taste of Honey came out to be. But it's interesting that they were considering that instead of Taste of Honey. But there you go, uh, using the word eclectic. The fact that the <clears> Beatles <throat> would do a song like Bass on My Mucho. Right. Right. You know, and then mix that with all the rockers and the ballads and the girl groups and everything else and all the 50s rock that they loved. I mean, the Beatles was you know, the greatest amalgamation of different styles of music. And it seeped through their music early on, and it and you heard it through all the phases of their career and into their solo music. Mm-hmm. It yeah. really becomes more apparent when you look back even further to the Hamburg, you know, to what they did in Hamburg and look through and. It, you know all the all the uh, song lists that Mark Lewis has in in uh, in his uh, in Beatles Live, where he talks about you know what they played um, in the cavern and everything like that. I mean, there's some great songs. Unfortunately, a lot of them don't exist that we'll never get to hear. But I mean, they did some incredible stuff way back when. You know, right? So. Yeah. I mean, just the fact that uh, you look through the Lewis and books and. You know, the fact that uh, they did Over the Rainbow, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, at the same time that they did Sweet Little Sixteen. Yep. Yeah, I would have loved to. I would've, that would have been uh, that would have been something to hear. You know, you, you kind of hope that somebody somewhere has stuff locked away and, or they don't know what they have. And uh, I don't know that that's ever going to happen. But, you know, it sure would be nice. Um, yeah, because some of those song titles that Lewis has listed are just amazing. And, you know, uh, looking ahead to his book, he's been he's been dropping, you know, he's been dropping comments that, um, you know, that he's going to have all sorts of stuff, and people are just hanging on uh, the edge waiting for those books to come out. And, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to it, too. Uh, well, it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of drifting off the subject, but the one thing that I'm going to be most curious about, and, and, and any time that you learn anything new about the Beatles, it's fascinating. But if Mark actually comes up with information that actually uh, refutes what the Beatles have said in their version of the story, that, mm-hmm. that would be fascinating. Mm-hmm. Do you believe the Beatles story the way the Beatles have told it? Or are there times when you you might not fully agree or, or right. doubt their version of the story. So maybe Mark will clear up a few things. He's been leading everybody, I shouldn't say leading everybody to believe. He's been basic. he's been saying that he's discovered some incredible stuff. Um, I know he's, he's told me that in email a, a couple of times, and uh, he said that in a, in a couple of things I've written. So we can only, I mean, he's not saying anything, he's not dropping any hints, Yet, hmm. I'm sure he will come. Clo- you know, when the when we get closer to publication, but yeah, apparently there's going to be some amazing discoveries in those uh, about the about this, especially about these early years, and that's going to be that's going to be very interesting. Yeah. Well, getting but, back to please please me. 
mm-hmm. one of the things that I wanted to bring up, and this is a, something that it, it's it's kind of a a different way of looking at the Beatles now, but I always used to think growing up as a little kid, hearing these early songs, that the Beatles were uh, very poppy. You know, their music was pop music. Mm-hmm. I didn't think of it as much as R&B. You know, you tend to think of the Stones and the Who maybe as being more R&B and blues-based, right. but Paul McCartney said that he thought of the Beatles, or they thought of themselves, as a little R&B band. Now, when you hear songs like Anna, I can certainly understand that. Twist and Shout, definitely. These right. are these are songs that were done by R&B artists, but it's just, it's... um. I don't know. It's it's a different way of looking at the Beatles now because it's so easy to hear those early pop songs. Well, I'm calling them pop. Please, please me. Do you hear R and B in that music, or do you think pop? I think personally, I think it's more pop than R and B. And I'll and I'll, one of the books I was looking through today said the uh, said please please me had actually origins in a Bing Crosby song called Please. That's right. I've said so, that on my show too, and John John said that in uh, the Playboy interview. Okay, but he um, he was, he was very was... much intrigued by a line in the song, which is "Please lend your little ears to my pleas," mm-hmm. and the double use of the word "please." Right. This was uh, Walter Edwards, uh, the Beatles as music, music uh, musicians. But there, you're talking about a well, lyrical influence. We're not talking about the style of the music. Well, I don't know. I mean, I don't think you. I I think there's a little bit of both there because "Please Please Me" is not a what I would call an R and B song. Hmm. Um, you know, I mean, obviously they they were influenced by a lot of the R and B artists. They they mentioned Smokey Robinson a lot in the early oh, interviews. Sure. People like that, Marvin Gaye, and of course the '50s R and B artists. But mm-hmm. you know, when you hear an album like "Please Please Me," do you still think pop, or do you think they had more of an R and B edge? I'm still I'm still going to hold on on pop because that's really what they were going for uh, you know a young um, I, I hate to say young white audience but that's what they were going for so I would think it was it was more toward that that vein because they took they did when they covered Chains for example they didn't slow it down they did it you know they did it up tempo same with Baby It's You. Um, Baby It's You is is kind of mid-tempo I wouldn't say it's a fast song Baby It's You No, Uh, Hold Me Tight is probably if if you had to pick one song Hold Me Tight is as close to R&B as I thought You mean of their original songs? Mm Mm-hmm Yeah, you know but all the other songs, all the other original songs you know, Sar standing there I mean, that's rock and roll you know, um, do you want to know a secret that might be a little close to R and B, but more. Uh, George also kind of sang it, kind of. Um, he sang it in a kind of in a, a popish voice. He didn't really get soulful there. Hmm. So I, 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 you know, I would say I would say pretty much they stayed popish because, you know, that's what they were looking for. Okay. That would be because... that would be my that would be my theory. I mean, do you do you agree? Um. I guess so, but I still I I'm acknowledging more of an R and B influence now than I ever have before. Because certainly when I hear Anna, I think that when I hear Twist and Shout, I hear that. Well, that's true. I mean, I, I you know that's absolutely true, and because especially because those songs uh, had some R and B had an R and B background. Right, but also their um, delivery on it, I think, and John's voice was very suitable for that R and B kind of delivery. Mm-hmm. There's a melodic there's a melodic feel to to John's vocals as well as a roughness too, which helped to give it an R and B feel. But again, the Beatles did a lot to they um, they brought you know a lot of soul music and a lot of R and B to white audiences, and that you know they introduced uh, you know I mean we all know that, and so just them singing those they they put their own um, branding on. Those on those songs and um, and uh, and you know made them good for for AM radio. So, right. I um, also think that it's interesting that, and this is just a a little observance that I've made. If mm-hmm. ever you go to a wedding or a bar mitzvah and uh, they're playing music there, and you're going to hear '60s music at all, if there's any Beatles songs you're going to hear, 
it's going to be either Twist and Shout or I Saw Her Standing There. Those are the ultimate dance songs from the Beatles. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of ironic. Those are the two songs that open and close this album. Right. Right. Interesting. To wrap things up, let, let me just say I think the album has stood the test of time. It still sounds it still sounds great, you know. And and I mean it was it it got them it got them going and they, there's you know, they they should be very proud of that. Well, historically everything the Beatles released is important. But do you think that all these years later that this album and their early music sounds fresh to you still, or does it sound in any way dated? I always like the early albums. I always, well, I always like the early albums. Actually, in some respects, I can listen to the early albums a little more than the later ones. But um, I like the early ones because they always had a freshness to them. Uh, they always had a kind of a spark to them um, because they they were so. They were still trying. It was like they were playing at the cavern, you know. Getting back to that comment about uh, recording, wanting to record, please, please, please me, and at the cavern. But yeah, I mean, it's it's got a spark to it. It's a it's a great, it's a very energetic album, all the way through. Well, I agree with you. I don't really see the early stuff as sounding dated to me. You know, I still think it has so much energy and and so much there's there's exuberance there. And that translates through in the music. And the songs are still really strong. And the Beatles were great at doing covers as well as their original songs. It's fascinating to, to study them and to see the progress that they made year by year or album by album. And for a debut, I think that uh, this was a mighty impressive start. Yep, I agree. So if you would like to get in touch with us, we have an email address, which is things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. If you want to find out more about my radio show, which is Every Little Thing, and it's syndicated on almost 20 stations now in the country, you can look up my website, which is KenMichaelsRadio.com. And also, if you could, check out my live show for Every Little Thing, which is on WNHU, Wednesday nights from 8 to 10 Eastern Standard Time, and you can stream the show on WNHU.net. And Steve, to get in touch with you, people have to do what? They can go to uh, examiner.com and uh, look up uh, Beatles Examiner, and that's me. Um, or you can email me at beatlesexaminer at gmail.com. I'm also on Facebook under my name, and uh, the column has a page. And uh, you can catch me there. And we're, uh, all, over, uh, we're all over the radio, too, so you can, you can hear us there, too. And we just want to say thanks to all of our listeners for your support of the show. We know that the numbers are growing here in our listenership, so we really appreciate you tuning into our shows and tell your friends who are Beatle fans about us. Yep, and, and more fun to come. That's right. So, for Things We Said Today, this is Ken Michael saying thanks so much for listening, and I'll see you next time. And this is Steve Baranucci, and I'll see you next time. <laughs>